Diamond. Take it away, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our Eleanor London Code St. Luke Public Library monthly book talk with me, Kathy Diamond. Um, you know, I realized as I was getting ready, I was, I was preparing for this month's book talk that it's been 40 years since I started animating a monthly book talk at the Coast Saint Luke Library. 40 years, that's a really long time. And that's back when the library was upstairs in the Coast Saint Luke Shopping Center, which I'm sure some of you, I hope some of you listeners will remember that. And it was the summer of 1982. I don't remember which month. I mean, it could have been between May and August, one of those months. But I remember Eleanor London, the late, great Eleanor London had an idea that we should have a Monday morning program for seniors at the library. And it was originally going to be every Monday morning at 10 o'clock for an hour. And it would be different things. She thought one, one, one week a month would be a book talk and another would be, I don't know what she would, different ideas. So that the different ideas lasted for a while. But what stuck was the book club. And it was called, and this is really funny because 40 years ago, I was in my early 20s and I, well, not so, anyways, 20s, early 20s. And um, the book club was called the Over 50s Book Club because it was for seniors. And I was not a senior at the time. And I thought, oh, wow, seniors, you know, it's a good idea, these nice older ladies. Um, and it's sort of funny because here I am 40 years later, still doing the book club. And um, now I am definitely one of the over 50s that I thought, oh, it's for older, older people. I mean, it wasn't just women, anybody could have come. Um, but the original group were, were women. And what I wanted also to say was that the first book that we did, and I still remember, and that's a lot of books that we talked about in 40 years, basically 40 times 12. I mean, occasionally I missed some, but it's a lot of books under the, a lot of water under the bridge, a lot of reading under the bridge. But the first book club book, and I don't know if there happens to be anybody listening this afternoon who was there, I guess probably, no, actually that would not really, well, uh, not so possible. Anyhow, the first book that we talked about, and this was Eleanor London's suggestion, she said, there is a book that she loved called a Woman of Independent Means. And the author of that book is, uh, was a woman by the name of Elizabeth Forsythe Haley. And so I looked it up again because I thought it's very appropriate 40 years later. The book that I'm going to be talking to you about today, once I finish telling you about what happened 40 years ago, is this book, Hannah, Hannah Han, the author pronounces it, Hannah Han Carries On, which is written partially in an epistolary style. Epistolary meaning written in letters. That's the definition of epistolary style. So A Woman of Independent Means, the first book that we did at the monthly book club back in 1982, 40 years ago, was an epistolary novel, this book called A Woman of Independent Means, which I was thinking that we should do again, and I would really like to do it again. It was published in 1978, and it's a book told in letters. In that case, okay, it's back in 78 where it was letters. In the book that we're gonna be talking about today, I don't know how many of you have read it, but it's, it's the modern age version of telling a story in letters. This time it's through podcasts and through text messages. But back in 1978, when Elizabeth Forsythe Haley wrote A Woman of Independent Means, most Americans, uh, we're just beginning to realize what feminism was and feminism was be well maybe not just beginning it began in the 60s i guess one could say but feminism was beginning to become associated with these angry women who neglected their femininity and were capable of shocking radicalism but the book a woman of independent means portrayed a very different ideal for the socially responsible woman of the 20th century. And the character in the book, the first entry in that novel was in 1899, 
and the last entry was in 1968. So that's the time span that this book, A Woman of Independent Means, looks at. And of course, you can imagine it's the first 60 years, roughly 70 years of the 20th century where great changes took place. So it was a wonderful book. It was really interesting. It was an interesting story. The main character was a, was a, a wonderful person, this sheltered, privileged woman who was gradually changed due to circumstances, due to life, of course, and she becomes a competent woman and she encounters adversity with, in, with increasing intelligence and, and, and sensitivity and courage. And it, so it was also made, interestingly, and I'll finish with this talking about a woman of independent means, but it was made into a film with Sally Fields. And again, similarity with the book that we're going to be talking about today, which apparently has been optioned by Mindy Kaling, which, who is a popular figure now, um, and Amazon Pictures or some of the Amazon Studios are going are working together on bringing this book. I mean, it's it's just been optioned, so I don't know if it's going to actually turn into a movie, but it also has the potential. As did a woman of independent means that yes was made into this film version with Sally Fields, and that's the book that we began forty years ago. The Coatesville Library monthly book club that I've been doing ever since. Thank goodness. So um, that said and done, the book that we're, this book, Hannah Khan carries on, is a second novel or a sophomore novel, I learned that's the term for the second novel of an author, by a young Toronto writer whose name is Uzma Jalaluddin, Jalaluddin or how, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing it properly, but anyways, Uzma Jalaluddin is a Toronto writer and this is her second book. She is, she's a very um, accomplished, and she's a young, well, to me, young woman. She was born in 1980, just two years before we started the Coast Lake Library Book Club. And she is an English teacher. She, well, she's married, the mother of two teenage sons, um, an English and science teacher, high school teacher, where she said she's been teaching for over 20 years. And she writes a column, a very popular column in the Toronto Star, in the newspaper, the Toronto Star as well. I don't know if anybody ever reads it, but she writes a bi-weekly column, which um, it seems to be very popular. And it's called Samosas and Maple Syrup. And it's a parenting advice column, more parenting and just you know, different, different um, musings on life as as a parent and as a citizen of, and a mother in Toronto today. She is, and she also shares, so this is her second book. Her first novel was published several years ago, Aisha at Last. I don't know if anybody read it. It was a very, it became quickly very, pop, very popular. It was listed for the Toronto Book Awards. It was long listed, short listed for all these different prizes, including the Stephen Leacock Humor Award. And it, the first, so her first novel, this Aisha at last, has been compared favorably with Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And she, um, in this book, she, what she has done, she, she said that she very much is influenced and enjoys, um, she enjoys podcasts and she enjoys epistolary novels. And she also loves 1990s rom-coms. So the, the second book, this Hannah Khan carries on, is based on the very popular movie, You've Got Mail with Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks. Um, and back in those days, back in the ancient days of the 1990s, people used email. So it's funny because how things have changed. And so she says that she um, that she based this she in an interview with Sheila Rogers. Sheila Rogers is an interviewer with the CBC, and she asked Uzma why she wrote this book, and she says. She answers, the author answers. The origin story of this book goes back to 2017, which is five years ago now, which feels like a million years ago right now. The book 
by the way, the book came out last year. She says, my husband and I were celebrating my birthday. We were at a very upscale halal restaurant that serves American style food, burgers, steaks, ribs, things like that. Not traditional Indian or Southeast Asian or even Mediterranean, Middle Eastern food, but American style food. The thing that makes it halal mean is the meat is killed according to, to the rules of Islam to how which makes it halal. Similarly, the way you can go to a kosher restaurant and it could be any kind of kosher food as long as the laws of kosher are observed. So she says, I thought that it would be a great way to explore the way that this was inspired by eating dinner with her husband at this halal restaurant that served American and Canadian food. And she said food, because of course food, you know, food is a very important part of, well, of life, of course, but also of any immigrant experience and immigrant story. And she said, I thought, and this is where I got the idea for this novel, that it would be such a great way to explore the way that the changing dynamic of immigrants evolves over subsequent generations. And like, why? So she says, because my husband and I were talking and we were remarking that this kind of a restaurant, this kind of a halal certified restaurant did not exist when we were growing up in Toronto. And remember, these are young, I mean, relatively young people. She's only, she was born in 1980 and her husband maybe is about the same age or a year or two older. But she said, when we were growing up in Toronto, we didn't have these kind of halal restaurants. And I thought that this would be so, this gave me, this was the germ of the idea for my second novel. She said, and I also just love food. So both these things combined, I thought it would be really fun to explore. As well, she continued, I love the classic rom-coms, the 90s rom-coms. And one of the really popular tropes of these rom-coms, as anyone who watches watch them or watches them, is enemies to lovers. And actually recently, there have been a number of them on Netflix, I see, in the in the 2020s, the same thing, um, you know, different variations, but basically the same thing, enemies to lovers. And she, the author of the book, Uzma Jalaluddin says, I am such a sucker for that trope. I love it so much. So I knew that in the very beginning, just by the nature of, and it's the, the main, one of the main characters present in the neighborhood, a young man by the name of Aideen, He's the owner of the new restaurant that is threatening Hannah Khan, the, the, whose name is in the title. She's the, the, the main ca female character of the book. Um, and she, and she, her family has a restaurant. Basically, her, her mother has a restaurant. And, the, and this other young man, his appearance on the scene, he's opening up a restaurant across the street from her, Hannah's family's business. And so, of course, they would be immediately enemies. And she says, I really enjoyed playing up the tension between these two characters, between Hannah and Aiden. In their very first meeting, he shows up at the restaurant and she doesn't know who he is. And he talks down to her, thinking that she's just the waitress and she gets offended and they're off to the races. That's the beginning of the story. And they have multiple interactions where they banter back and forth, but they do give each other a chance. And that's the beginning of them becoming friends. She says, this is the author again speaking in this interview, with stories that are set in regionalized or marginalized communities, I find that a lot of the tension comes with justification. She says, I don't say this is not justified. But tension comes from parents, these immigrant parents who are demanding things from their children or, depending on the family dynamics, expecting things from their children. And that is definitely a conflict that some children in immigrant, in immigrant families face. But then I also think, she continued, about a lot of people I know who do come from those backgrounds and their parents never really force the issue, but they still feel a responsibility 
towards giving back to the community and giving back to their family. I wonder about these kids who internalize that responsibility, even though their parents don't push it on them. Say to them, just do what makes you happy. It's fine. Do what makes you happy. Run after your dreams. But is it that easy for everyone growing up in an immigrant family who has seen how hard the parents have struggled and all their you know, blood, sweat, and tears that they put in to building new lives for themselves. And if they have these expectations for their children of, of going into a good profession, making a stable, steady living, um, i.e. if the child is capable of and academically does well enough, the doctor, the lawyer, the engineer, the accountant, the uh, I don't know, financial advisor, not an artist or not something that doesn't have such stability. It's typical of all immigrant communities. In this case, um, Uzma Jalaluddin writes about the Southeast, Southeast, Southeast Asian community. She's Muslim and her parents are from Southeast Asia. She herself was born in Toronto, grew up in Scarborough, but her parents were immigrants to Canada. So that's a relatively new immigrant story in on the Canadian Sea. You know, there have been waves of immigrants before the immigrants from Southeast Asia. There were immigrants from, from Europe who came, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. The Italians who came in the, let's say, in the 50s and 60s, the Jews who started to come from escaping poverty and pogroms in the, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. So there are already several generations of immigrants advanced, you know, more ahead. But what Uzma writes about in this book are the mainly first generation Native Canadians to immigrant parents in these Southeast Asian communities. And so she says, this is what I've always thought about because she herself grew up as a child of immigrants. She, the first generation Canadian, um, with parents who she said were did not have these expectations for her. They were not the kind that you have to be a lawyer, you have to be an engineer or you do it. Um, but she still always felt, she said, there is a sense of responsibility to your parents who worked so hard to get to where they are today and a feeling of you have to help them with that. So she said that um, that she grew up in Scarborough, which is an east end suburb of Toronto and a very, very um Eclect, well not eclectic, but a community with many different ethnic groups with a very large Southeast Asian community, a very large Muslim population. And that's where she, both she and her husband grew up. So she said that um, in this book, she said she had written a number of drafts. In fact, when I listened to a couple of interviews with her of Long and she gave several book talks. And yesterday I was listening to an interview, a talk she gave with the Ottawa Public Library a number of months ago. And in it, she said that, you know, I had a complete first draft of this novel. I gave it into my editor and my editor said, mm, there's something about this that I don't like that doesn't work. And what was it? It was, whereas in the final edition of the book, which you have may have read, whether you've read the book or not, the, um, it's a podcast that the, the main character has a podcast. And in this podcast, she muses, it's just like, it's basically an, a, a, a diary uh, told, you know, an audible diary. But in the original version of the book, there is a video game being played and the characters go back and forth the 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 two main characters go back into the ones who talk about the in the podcast in the novel he, they were playing a video game but her editor didn't like that version and she gave it back to Usma and said rewrite this please so she said basically I had to go through the whole book and write it again um that was only one of the reworkings she says the book took me many many years to write and she said that wasn't so easy because I'm a teacher, a full-time teacher with all the work that goes along, not just the teaching, but the marking and the lesson preparations. Um, I'm also a mother. I have two boys. 
and I write this biweekly column for the Toronto Star, which I have to basically write an essay once every two weeks. So she says, it took me a while. It took me years to write this book. But her love of language, and if you've read this book, or if you've read her first novel as well, you get this sense that she loves language. It's evident in every sentence that she writes, as is her gift for precise plotting and her clearly defined immediately lovable characters. So she says, you don't usually see a woman in a hijab having agency and being the star of her own love story. But she says that this idea of a lengthy crafting process isn't new to her. Her first novel, Aisha at Last, also took her a long time to write. She said, because I couldn't write every day, I you know, had other responsibilities. It did take me around seven years to complete the first draft, um, a final draft of my first novel. And that story, as I said, has been, it has the Jane Austen connection to a happy accident. She says, you know, I know it sounds sort of ridiculous looking back on it, but I also feel like I was writing in a vacuum back then. Her parents had emigrated, the author's parents had emigrated to Canada from India, and she seldom saw, she said, an experience, and she was a voracious reader as a child, but she said, I seldom saw a character who looked like me, who had experiences like me in the books that I was reading as a kid and even as a young adult. And she said in the early 2010s, there was so little South Asian representation in romance or in comedies, especially the South Asian Muslim representation. So part of the reason why I decided to turn my head toward Jane Austen in my first book was because I was a little bit scared that people wouldn't know how to deal with my personal story. And her concerns were justified, she said. Even with the Austen hook, Aisha, Aisha at last, her first novel, was rejected countless times by publishers who didn't know how to sell a novel that featured characters and storylines outside of the industry's narrow expectations of a Muslim romance. So she said, you, you expect more the story about an arranged marriage where the girl runs away, takes off her hijab, and dates a white boy. That's the story we usually heard not one where she falls in love with a conservative Muslim man who changes a bit, but still has his beard on at the end of it. So this, st this, this style that Uzma has taken on by adopting familiar framework, like the beats of a rom-com or the slower pace of an Aust Jane Austen novel, she artfully manages to deploy these classic tropes to give happy endings to characters from backgrounds like her own, like Uzma Jalaluddin's own background, which were rarely represented and are still pretty rarely represented in the works that she's referencing. And those happy endings are not just the romance happy part ending part not just the, the romantic love she also addresses which makes her books you know you can read them and you say oh this is like i mean it's it's you could call it chick lit i guess it's rom-com which is light and you know fluff and a good summer read except that given that and yes and it's easy to read and you could read it in a night or two depending how many hours you have in your night or two but she also addresses other aspects of her heroine's experiences, such as community, identity, and honoring your faith in a secular society. Though both of her novels contain similar pleasures, one could say, the author herself says that there are differences between her debut, Aisha at last, and this one, Hannah Khan carries on, which was written during a time of political and social upheaval. She said, in the past few years, I was more aware of some storm clouds gathering. And I think that that comes through in my second novel. And she says, and in the book, if you've read it, Hannah and her community 
have to deal with what are called microaggressions as well as hate crimes. So hate crimes are the bigger version of when when things are are crimes when you could when you could you know pursue somebody for committing a hate crime or the microaggressions which are the smaller little um insults and indignities that someone has to of a minority has to endure in daily life which happens in the book as well we have both the hate crime and the number of microaggressions that the main character as well as the other as other characters in her novel have to deal with in and the book is set by the way in toronto in scarborough as her first novel was she said also that she's working on a third novel and she says and maybe that will complete what i think i'm going to call in my head anyway my toronto trilogy and then maybe she'll move on to something different but She's, and I think it's a very smart decision, was a very wise decision of hers to stay in the neighborhood and deal with the, um, with the things that she knows about. You know, I, I guess a, a writer is usually given the advice that write about what you know. That's the, usually the classic advice that a beginning writer is given. And in this case, this was her you know, first, now it's her second novel, but she seems to have heeded, I don't know if she was given that advice, but she has heeded this, this line, this bit of advice, and it works out very well because she know this is what she knows, this is what she is passionate about writing about, and it comes through as authentic. And to me, there's nothing worse than reading a book in which a writer has recreated a world and tried to write about a world in which he or she is, with which he or she, the author, is not familiar. And some of the little details are wrong. And I, this makes me crazy. I, I find it very grating when things are, are gotten wrong by a writer. In this case, Usman knows the details. I mean, I, I'm not familiar with with Muslim customs, but I, I read a number of many reviews and even on the you're familiar probably with the Goodreads website where readers post their own reviews. They're not, you know, formal reviews and the the it came out that they said reader after reader that great yay Uzma you finally got it right you're describing us the details are correct the little the nuances the all the aspects of your story are spot on because of course Uzma is writing about what she knows so she says that the so as and as I said and as the author says she's writing about these microaggressions and these hate crimes while she's having her characters pursue their dreams and there is this passion, there is this devotion of Hannah's family to keeping their own halal restaurant afloat, um, as well as with Hannah, the main character of the book, the young woman who, who, who tells the story, it's told from first person, her excitement and her ambition in launching her podcast which is similar to the passion in the author herself's voice when she is discussing her path from reader to writer. Because as I said, she said that the author said, when I was young, I wondered, where is the Muslim Bridget Jones? Where is the Muslim Meg Cabot? And so she decided that if I couldn't find these characters in the books that I was reading, once she realized that being a writer is what she wanted to do, and she's clearly a very talented writer. She said, I would write the books that I wish I could have had to read when I was a girl. And so here we have this romantic comedy from Uzma Jalaluddin. We have the main character, Hannah, or Hanan is her, is her full name. Hannah is her, what her family calls her, an aspiring radio host who is working also long hours in her family's halal restaurant. When an aunt and a cousin come to town, town meaning Toronto, Scarborough, the Golden Crescent neighborhood, as they call themselves, and a rival restaurant is being opened across the street in her neighborhood, Hannah's life is upended and family secrets are revealed. 
Fighting for her family is a big battle, and it's going to be one that will put all of Hannah's skills to the test. And it's a battle that gets more complicated by Hannah's growing attraction to the rival restaurant's attractive young owner, Aiden. So that's the rom-com, that's the romantic interest here. So she, and the story we have, the main character, as I said, is Hannah Khan. Hannah Khan, pronounce it properly. That's how the author pronounced it. I call it, I used to say, I said Khan, but it's Khan, is our hijab wearing young Muslim woman, 24 years old, who lives in Scarborough, Ontario. And she is interested in radio and storytelling. And she also has a job as one of two interns at a local radio station, as well as working at her family's halal restaurant in her other off hours from her other job. She hopes, because she said her dream is to work in radio. But of course she works in her family's restaurant because that's what you do. Your family has a restaurant and the restaurant doesn't do all that well that they can afford to hire outside labor. So Hannah, her older sister, her brother-in-law, they all help out in the restaurant. We also find out that her father had a bookkeeping business until he was recently, relatively recently, in this is the story, injured in a terrible car accident. And he is left very, very um, damaged by this and he can no longer work. So unfortunately he can't help. And the restaurant, that, which is has always her mother's baby, her mother has golden hands and is a wonderful cook and opened this restaurant. And it's really was always a mom and pop kind of restaurant, nothing fancy, nothing trendy, but wonderful food. But with the, you know, the decor was nothing, the lighting wasn't great, but people came to this restaurant because especially if they wanted, and these were, you know, the, the neighbors, the neighborhood people came because the food was terrific. So now across the street is going to be opening this very trendy, fancy, schmancy halal restaurant that's going to serve, serve very trendy food in luxurious, very upscale settings, threatening the, this other, this long time mom and pop restaurant that Hannah's mother has put her heart and soul into ever since she emigrated from India. But as Hannah, this young Muslim woman who dreams of a career in radio and why, she wants to tell stories. This is her dream. This is her goal. This is her passion in life, telling stories that value her culture and experience stories that challenge existing stereotypes. And she has started doing that to some extent with her podcast. This is her, but her podcast is not a job. This is just something that she has started to do. And she calls her podcast Anna's Brown Girl Rambles because she takes on a pseudonym in her podcast. She doesn't say this is going to be an anonymous podcast. And so instead of she being Hannah, in her podcast, she calls herself Anna, A-N-A. -A. So Anna's Brown Girl Rambles. And in this podcast, she explores the big questions of life, but anonymously and free from judgment. And how does the book open? First of all, I just wanted to say that Uzma Jalaluddin has dedicated this book to her parents. Her parents, she says, to, for my parents, Mohammed and Asma Jalaluddin, who taught me the importance of community, even as they built one. So you can see what's important for the author. And the opening, so just to give you a little bit from the book, just how the way she writes, the opening page reads, here are the rules. This is a single person podcast, not a variety show, no interviews, not a comedy hour. I'm not going to tell you my name or any specific biographical details, except the following. I'm a South Asian Muslim woman in my 20s. I was born and live in the city of Toronto. And I love radio, really love it. I also love the free form of podcasts. This particular podcast will be about having a place to ask questions without worrying who might be listening and judging. I'm talking about the big questions, future friends, such as what do you want out of life? What do we owe the people we love? How do our histories and stories influence who we become? And how do you know that the thing you want 
is actually the thing you want. There you have it, listeners, my mission statement. I promise no frills and a clear voice. I promise nothing of substance and nothing but my truth. I promise to take this seriously, but I'm also definitely making it up as I go along. That's the opening page to the book. And then you get, and then she says, whoever and wherever you are, welcome to Anna's Brown Girl Rambles. I can't wait to start a conversation with you. And the first in the comments that comes up is Stanley P, somebody by the name of Stanley P. This popped up in my podcatcher. Nice first episode. I'm always interested in the big questions. And then she responds. And this is where you've got this, you've got Mayo, Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks thing, because then it goes back and forth. So Stanley P, this anonymous listener, is, is writing back and forth to Anna Brown Girl Rambles. And these little, these little conversations and her bits of podcast will come, well, they are, they are going to be interspersed with regular text throughout the book. And this differs from a woman of independent means the book that I did for we did 40 years ago because that was all written in letters epistolary. But this one, because in podcasts and in little text messages, it's a little different. So the whole book is not written this way, but interspersed with the regular story and the text are these little are the bits of podcast and the dialogue. And so, you know, and, and it's very like it does form page long pages in the book, but it's by no means the main part, uh, I mean, the, the only part of the story. So there you have it. That's the introduction. So that's the podcast part. And the and since so since the release of this first podcast episode, Hannah has had a loyal fan, Stanley P. And they went from conversing, I guess, as the as they did in the uh, You've Got Mail, from conversing in comments to texting multiple times a day. And Hannah debates throughout the story, revealing her true identity to him, but she never does. Her family runs a restaurant, as I referenced. What's the type? What's the name of this restaurant? It's really quite funny. It's called the Three Sisters Biryani Poutine Restaurant. So this is a very bizarre title. Three Sisters Biryani is, as she explains, a traditional Southeast Asian dish that her mother makes wonderfully. This is her signature dish. But poutine is, as we all know, because we're here in Quebec, what poutine is. And Hannah, when she was nine years old, apparently asked her mother to combine the two. And, and she says, nobody else likes it. It's disgusting to most people. And the idea of combining poutine and this biryani, which is a basmati rice and marinated chicken and all kinds of ingredients dish on its own, but to stick poutine on top of it. But her mother humored her and made this dish. And then they gave their restaurant the name after this dish that nine-year-old at the time Hannah had requested because it's such a bizarre name. Um, and that's the name that stuck on this in this restaurant. Her mother's cooking is, is, is incredible. She has a reputation that, as I said, she has golden hands and, and th this is why people come to the restaurant. However, the restaurant is struggling. And the family doesn't have the money because, as I said, her father had been in a terrible car accident. They can't renovate the restaurant. They do no advertising, but they're still very dependent on the restaurant um, where Hannah and her mother, sister, brother-in-law are working there because of this car accident of her father, who is left unable to work. And as I said, one day, this young man and his father, the father of this young man, show up at their restaurant. That's in the opening scene as well. The father is very rude, um, and his son is not so rude, but the son comes along with him. And they having, are having a hard time, especially the father, to hiding their disdain for the restaurant, at least for the way it looks. And they eat a meal, but they leave it halfway. The meal is delicious. They order this biryani dish, um, and but they have they leave in the middle. The the father suddenly gets up, and the son follows him. The son, however, returns later that night to the restaurant, and he apologizes to Hannah for his rudeness and for leaving all that good food, and he asks for more of the biryani. 
And Hannah is first, she's angry at him because she was so offended when he and his father left. But then she is flattered that this young man it, it appreciates her mother's food and she brings him some more of this biryani. Soon after this incident, Hannah finds out that this boy, Aydin Shah, and his father are the ones opening the competing halal restaurant nearby. So how, how does she react? And so there's, there are different things going through this book. There's quite a, quite a, a bit of action. Um, and she acts in ways, and this is, I think, one of the strengths of the book is that Hannah, she's only 24 years old. She's a young woman. I mean, in her mind, you know, she's an adult, but she knows she's setting out and on her life, on her adult life. She's finished school. She knows that her passion is radio. She really wants a career in radio. She's got this internship where she works with another young man of East Asian um, origin. In fact, he, Thomas, He's he's in he comes from the same place in in India or, or somewhere close by in India, but he's a Christian. But he, as he tells her towards the end of the book, she was born in Toronto. He is an immigrant. He came when he was 12 years old and so he had to he had no English. He had to learn English. So for him to have achieved this internship as well is probably even more of a big thing. So these two young interns are working together and there's tension between the two of them because Thomas as still as new immigrant, because he wasn't born there, wants to do anything he can to get his career going. And even if their boss at the radio station wants them to do, and she's this well-meaning, politically correct, trying to be woke young white woman, their boss who has ideas for shows but her ideas, they grate Hannah the wrong way because Hannah doesn't want anything stereotypical. She has her ideas, what she wants to produce or what she wants to talk about on a radio show, whereas Thomas is much more ready to tow whatever the party line is, do with exactly whatever his boss asks him because he is still a new immigrant. He's, you know, a generation behind Hannah and he want he really wants to make it so the so you have the what's going on at the radio station where Hannah has her internship and you have the problems at the family restaurant where this new competitor is opening up across the street and it's Hannah's reaction to all of this um, and what she does. And she does a few things that are really not very nice and not very morally ethical. She creates an anonymous Facebook account to start a smear campaign against this newly started restaurant across the way, spreading, how does she do this? Spreading doubt as to whether the burgers will really be halal or not. And it's funny because it's the kind of thing that you could see hmm, in kosher restaurants, you know, you would think that maybe somebody could think of doing the same thing, that you would start a smear campaign saying, well, you know, their kashrut standards are not exactly what they should be and you really should stay away from there. Of course, this is all the age of social media. So young people, this is what they would do. So this is what one of the things that how Hannah reacts. But because it's a rom-com as well, Hannah, Hannah and Aiden keep finding themselves together in the book, and there is an undeniable attraction, but there's a tension, of course, because they're competitors. Neither of them wants to give up on their competition. And then, as I said, a cousin and an aunt come to stay with Hannah's family, visiting from India. And the aunt is quite an interesting character, an interesting personality, which the author has said there was, she based this character on stories that she heard from her own aunts in her own family. There, there are many wonderful characters in the book as well. And this young cousin, this 18 year old cousin, he's also a funny character. Um, and it happens that this, this young cousin, Rashid and Hannah, um, and Aiden from the young man across the street go on a trip to downtown, they go in downtown Toronto, and there is an incident which could be, which is classified as a hate crime. They are attacked by a white man and the three white men screaming obscenities and racial slurs against them and actually physically attack. As the cousin, this young 18-year-old Rashid, who as impulsive and young as our heroine 
Hannah is at 24, he's only 18 and he's even rasher and more impulsive, it seems. And he's videoing what's going on. Um, they, they're, it's Hannah who's slightly injured in this attack. She doesn't want to, of course, doesn't want to press charges, doesn't even want to tell her family about what happened to her. She's, she's embarrassed and she doesn't want to cause them any pain. And so she pushes aside the fact that this is a hate crime, except that young 18 year old cousin Rashid has made a video of it, which goes viral. This is the days of so our present time of social media. Her radio, her boss at the radio station wants her to speak about it, make a radio program, and she is very unwilling to do this because she doesn't want this incident to be blown up. She doesn't want her family to hear about it. She is very conflicted. So you see these, this whole, it's a rom-com, but there are some pretty serious issues that the author is writing about here. Because as I said, Rashid has this video of the incident. He posts it online. It gets over 100,000 views. And of course, the reactions. It attracts supporters and anti-Islam troublemakers. And then the story goes on. There's a planned community festival in the Golden, in the golden Triangle that it's an annual community festival there in their neighborhood in Scarborough, which, which they touted as a halal festival. Um, the troublemakers made it into a halal festival, and you know that something is going to happen. There's going to, is there going to be an even more violent outcome than this more minor incident where Hannah was injured by these this man shouting racial slurs at her? Um, the story goes on, and the festival takes place, and and, and something happens there. And Aiden and his father open up this restaurant. I mean, I mean, all kinds of there's there's definitely more to the plot, but I'm not going to give it away or tell more for those of you who haven't read it. Um, and meanwhile, Hannah's connection and her listener Stanley P are going through the story as she is she is still making her podcast. Um, and it's and when the time comes and they're feeling like Hannah's feeling well, hmm, you know, this he sounds very nice, this Stanley P, and she's thinking of revealing her identity to him. Um, and more things happen in the story. Um, there are some other, you know, little love stories in the book as well. And in the end, the and I say I don't want to because I don't know how many people have read the book so this is always the problem here I don't want to spoil the story because it's fun and um and by the end Hannah shares who she is on her podcast and her new podcast project and she and I'll try to read you well no I just could read you just another couple of paragraphs from the book just to give you an idea of the way Uzma Jalaluddin writes she says, and this is Hannah talking, and she's, she, as I said, it's written in first person narrative, working on a show. She's writing about her passion for radio. Working on a show, any show, was all that I had ever wanted to do. So far, all Thomas, that's her fellow intern, all Thomas and I had done in our internship was file, photocopy, archive, and research other people's stories. The first time I had done a job that excited me had been the day before when Marissa, that's her boss, had let me co-produce Big J's show. Hosting a show about culture and religion was not what I wanted to do. The worst part was Thomas knew how I felt. We had talked about it before. Who's going to tell the stories that only we know? We are South Asian. We're second generation immigrants. You're Indian Muslim and I'm Indian Christian, both minorities within minority communities. We have things to say and diverse perspectives that people would love to hear, he had argued. Although here he's telling her that he's second generation immigrant. Um, and it turns out that he's not. I guess he wanted to, I don't know, he pretended that to her. Is that your tagline? I'm brown, I'm interesting, listen to me. The minute this is and uh, uh, this is Hannah writing, uh, talking back. The minute I start start writing stories about the Muslim or the Desi, which I gather is Southeast Asian community, I will be put in a box, 
and that will be all I'll ever be known for or all I can ever do. I'm too young and interesting, this is Hannah talking, to be put in the exotic brown person expert for the next 30 years, I argued back to Thomas. Hannah, you could be the person who changes people's minds about Muslims, Thomas would counter. That comment always made me laugh. The bigots are never going to listen to me, and everyone else already likes me because, as an Indian Canadian, I stand for samosas and maple syrup. I'm good, and it's funny because the title, the yeah, the title of Usma Jalaluddin's column, her biweekly column, as I said in the Toronto Star, is samosas and maple syrup. So she gets, she puts that line in the book. The truth was, Thomas had less to lose. When a man talks about politics and religion next to a brown-skinned woman who wears hijab, guess who attracts the misogynist trolls and violent death threats? I come by my cowardice honestly, through the experiences of those braver than myself. I had no desire to be a social justice martyr. I wanted to follow my instincts and my own interests, not use my faith and skin color to provide teachable moments to listeners on demand. Thomas knew how I felt, yet he had pitched his stupid idea anyway. He really was the worst. So this is what she writes about that. And then just one final bit, and then I will come to a close. Maybe there are some questions. At the end of the book, because as I said, she opened the book by saying, Okay, here are the rules. This is a podcast, single person, not a variety show, no interview, not a comedy hour. I'm not telling you my name or details. She ends the book by saying, here are the rules. This is no longer a single person podcast. That means there might be interviews, a co-host, and possibly, if I'm feeling up to it, some comedy. Also, this whole anonymous thing isn't working for me anymore. So listeners, here we go. My name isn't Anna, it's Hannah Kang, and I'm 24 years old, and I live in Scarborough, an East End suburb of Toronto. My parents emigrated from India before I was born, and recently we ran a small halal restaurant called Three Sisters Biryani Puti. My mom let me name the place when I was nine years old because she didn't care about things like market research or worry about confusing her customers. Anyways, she goes on, I don't want to say too much because um, I, uh, I don't want to give it away. And she ends by saying, and finally, Hannah's first law of living states that everything is better told as a story and mine is still unfolding. I hope you tune in again soon for all the adventures that awake. And that's how she ends the book. So it's, it's, a, it's an easy read. It's a rom-com. It's her reworking. And she said very clearly in all the interviews with her that this is You've Got Mail. I took it and I redid it in my novel. I re, you know, I changed the, the, uh, the, the setting and I changed the technology and I changed the main characters, but that's basically what she based the book on. Because as she said, I love 90s rom-coms. That's what I watch. I can watch and watch. But she said, I also love Jane Austen. And her next book, she, as I said, she's working. I don't know if she's already finished or she's working, almost finished, her third. And set again in Toronto, based on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And she says, with a little bit of Shakespeare thrown in. So that's something to look forward to. It's an easy read. It's fun. It's also, I think, to Canadian, best Canadian readers, it's even more fun because it's set in Toronto. And it's, you know, so many references to things that we're very familiar with. It's very contemporary. The author writes with a, with, with a wit and with a sense of humor. And it'll be fun to read her third book as well. Thank you so much for listening. And um, I don't know if there are any questions. Um, I see a comment in the chat. Thank you so much to Lynn. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're enjoying it. I wish I could see you. And um, I'm hoping that one day soon we're going to get to see each other back in person. Um, I don't see anything in the questions, no open questions. So I guess I will say goodbye to you here if there are no questions. Last Thank chance for questions, yeah. everyone. <laughs> Questions? Nope, no questions today, Kathy. Oh, okay, all right.
Thank you so much. We'll thank see you. you all again in August. Yes, thank you very much. Have a good month and enjoy the summer and stay well. Bye. Bye-bye.